First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be here. I remember as an undergrad in doing engineering and trying to get into physics, I used to attend some of the initial ICTS uh, summer schools, particularly the International School on Topology in Quantum Matter many years ago. So it's a great pleasure to come back here and give a talk here. So I'll be talking about hawking Unruh effect and quasi-normal decay in lowest lambda levels. If you don't know what these uh, terms are, I'll try to explain the, that uh, during the talk. And this is the work I did uh, when I was in University of Illinois in Smita's group. And uh, currently I'm a postdoc at Max Planck Institute. So you can see uh, some of the results in this paper and we are coming up with a long paper and I've been doing my own exploration in this uh, field uh, for some time. So uh, let's start with something uh, familiar uh, to this audience and in fact there might be many experts in this audience on this which is the quantum Hall effect. So as uh, you might all know that there's this quantum quantized Hall conductance and associated topological characterization of that and uh, fractional charges and non-trivial braiding and bulk boundary correspondence and all these uh, very uh, striking manifestations of quantum mechanics at a microscopic level. And particularly what we'll be looking at is quantum Hall with an applied potential, specifically a hyperbolic kind of uh, potential. And this is, kind of, this is very relevant for various systems, uh, specifically of uh, experimental significance. Uh, this is used to model uh, quantum Hall systems with uh, applied point, point contact geometries. And that uh, point contact systems are relevant for anion interferometry and it has been used for short noise measurements and more recently in single electron optics and so on. And uh, it was also used in studying of uh, magnetic breakdown in some very early works by the Russians, specifically Asbel. And if you can look at the textbook of Lifshitz, Asbel and Kaganau, you can see some more analysis involving this potential in the presence of a magnetic field. And also in charcoal coding the model where if you have impurities where you have these hills and valleys and there again this uh, particular potential becomes uh, important. And more recently uh, it's also relevant for applying shears to the system with, in the context of quantum hall viscosity and so on. Uh, since this is a scattering problem, uh, one thing which uh, is calculated in this context is the transmission probability and this uh, transmission probability has this particular form which looks like a thermal form and this was in fact uh, first calculated exactly in the works of Fertigan, Halperin and Boutiquer long ago and it was also calculated in other contexts. Okay, so now we'll move to a completely different place which is Feynman's last blackboard. So there are a lot of amazing stuff written here what I cannot create if I do not understand and so on but particularly we'll be focusing on two things written here. One is the 2D hall and the other is acceleration temperature. So I'm not sure whether Feynman was thinking about quantum hall as such, uh, because quantum hall, um, even fractional quantum hall was already discovered, I think, by the time he passed away. Uh, and acceleration temperature here specifically refers to this thing called Unruh effect and the associated Hawking radiation. So what we'll be doing is to try to see some structural parallels between these two completely different platforms. So I would like to quote Marcel Proust. This is probably from his uh, three volume in the remembrance of last time. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes. So we'll try to see some of the probably known phenomena of, in quantum hall uh, platform, but in the eyes of uh, some of the phenomena which is happening in the co context of space time horizons. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Probably, there it is, it's the first one, yes. Okay, so yeah, so we are going to ask the question, what are the bare minimum ingredients that is, that are, those are necessary to understand this problem of uh, Hawking radiation and Unruh effect? So you might have heard of this in news and black holes are in the news a uh, lot these days that there are quantum fluctuations near the black hole horizon which lead to thermal radiation and there is the associated Unruh effect in which uniformly accelerating observers will perceive a thermal bath. Uh, I would like to broadly char characterize these things as thermal nature of space-time horizons. So we are going to ask what are the bare minimum, bare minimum ingredients to understand these things and move to a different platform uh, of quantum hall, specifically the lowest Landau level where you have non-commutative coordinates 
where we see the emergence of this particular model called the inverted harmonic oscillator. As uh, physicists, uh, we have seen the simple harmonic oscillator to be of uh, almost, you can see it at all uh, levels. And this, this is kind of a paradigmatic uh, counterpart of the inverted harmonic oscillator, and we'll see that it's equally important. And the idea is to move away from the idea of space-time. Like, so what I would like to stress is that usually when you hear about black holes and space-time in the context of condensed matter, you hear about analog gravity and dumb holes and ADS CFT correspondence. So this talk will not be about those two things. We are not going to try to create artificial space-times and dumb holes and so on. Uh, or we are not going to talk about ADS CFT correspondence. Rather, the idea is to move away from the space-time picture, picture to a more uh, familiar picture of phase space and try to distill certain fundamental structures like Rindler Hamiltonian in this context. Yes, so I'll uh, come to that. Uh, rather, I would like to just say that I'll be alluding to some concepts which are at the fundamentals of quantum statistical mechanics which have been used these days in the context of quantum gravity, broadly called as holography, though these two are related. This line of holography has been pursued by people like Tom Faulkner, Raphael Busso, and Cassini, and so on. So I'll be vaguely alluding to those concepts, though we'll not go completely there. But these are closely related to some fundamental ideas of quantum statistical mechanics. Okay, so let's try to understand what are these horizons, or black holes and light cones. So we might have learned in our uh, high school or undergraduate uh, that our Minkowski space has this causal structure given by light cone. So if you consider a trajectory, uh, if at this present moment the things which can causally affect me should come from the past light cone and things which can get affected in the future should be in the future light cone and the rest are space-like separated. So a trajectory must be such that it lies within this light cone. So a Minkowski space-time can be the thought of dotted with uh, these light cones locally, but once you put in gravity, things start changing. So Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity says that gravity is basically a manifestation of curvature of space-time. Now specifically when you have black hole, what black, uh, black hole uh, event horizon, what happens is that these light cones start tilting because of the curvature of the space-time, and the event horizon is the point where all the light cones are completely pointing inward. As a result of that, uh, the nature of these light cones is that you can only enter it this way, and you cannot cross it back. As a result, this black hole event horizon is a one-way membrane. So a simplest caricature of what this horizon or one-way membrane is this cartoon which is due to C.V. Vishveshwara, about whom you heard of, and I had the privilege of learning about these things long ago. And so the idea is that if a light wave crosses by you, you cannot run and catch up with it because you cannot travel traverse at the speed of light. So you can only cross it once. So that's the idea of one-way membrane. So the key thing which I want you to take out of this is that the horizon is a region in space-time beyond which there is restricted access to information. Okay. okay, so now we'll consider physics near these black hole event horizons or space-time horizons. So a black hole can be represented using a space-time diagram. Without going too much into details, there, there is a lot which goes into writing down the space-time diagram, but let's just focus on some uh, broader ideas here. So this region is inside the black hole. So this is the event horizon. As you can see, the trajectories of particles which get into the black hole cannot come back because the light cones are always pointing inward, and these are the trajectories outside the black hole. So the near horizon behavior, near these space-time horizons, uh, you can approximate the physics of all that using something called a Rindler space-time. Now this Rindler space-time is also uh, something which describes uniformly accelerating observers in a Minkowski space-time. Okay, so what are the features of this? So if you ask what are the trajectories of uniformly accelerating observers or observers sitting outside a black hole, those are these hyperbolic trajectories. And the features of this is that these are confined to x greater than zero. That is, they, they are confined to this particular wedge. And the light cone acts as a horizon for these uh, observers which are confined to this region. So this is called the Rindler wedge. And you can uh, actually write down a transformation from the flat Minkowski space to all this. 
uh, as you can see, it's a hyperbolic translation, hyperbolic transformation. So, but the main thing which we would use is uh, to ask the question, how does the clock tick for these observers? This is important because we are going to ask about the energy content and do quantum mechanics and so on later. So we are asking about the time translation. Uh, how does the clock tick in this Rindler space time? And it happens to be a hyperbolic rotation. So if you want later, I can show you it's a very simple argument which involves just special relativity. Uh, and you can also probably see it with this coordinate transformation, but this is a crucial thing. And this hyperbolic rotation happens to be, can be written as a Lorentz boost. As you might have uh, remembered from your undergrad, that the Lorentz boost is a hyperbolic rotation. You can write it down as a if you are not working with Lorentz factors and all that, if you work with rapidity, it's a hyperbolic rotation. Okay, so the key things which you would want to take from this is that we are interested in this Rindler dynamics near the space-time horizon. It is confined to this particular wedge. The light cone acts as a horizon. It acts as a half-space partition of the Minkowski space. And boost as a hyperbolic rotation generates time translation in this region. Okay. So far, everything has been completely classical. Now, we'll put in quantum mechanics. So when Hawking tried to do this, when he tried to do the quantum fluctuations near the black hole horizon, he found that black holes radiate. In his, the title of his paper was, was Black Hole Explosions, kind of a grand title. And uh, Andrew found out that accelerating observers can boil tea or heat their uh, chapati or whatever. But basically, the idea is that when you're accelerating, you perceive a thermal bath. Uh, which is kind of a surprising thing. Okay, so uh, what? So okay, so the statement which I would like to use for this particular talk is that Minkowski vacuum is thermal with respect to Rindler evolution, and this is something which we are going to try to distill and see if you if this can happen in quantum Hall system. Okay, so the simplest way to understand is that you consider a particular state in the Minkowski space time. And you try to integrate out the degrees of freedom in the left side of the wedge. When you do that, you end up with a thermal density matrix, thermal looking density matrix. And this particular object here is uh, usually called the uh, entanglement Hamiltonian or modular Hamiltonian, if you have seen that. And this happens to be something called a Rindler Hamiltonian. OK, so this entanglement Hamiltonian is usually a very non-local stuff. And it's not usually easy to write it down. But it happens in this specific context that it also manifests as a physical Hamiltonian which generates evolution uh, within this particular wedge. So we ask the question, what is this? Uh, how does the clock tick in this Rindler wedge? And the generator of time translation is the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian was the boost. And it happens that this Rindler Hamiltonian is given by this boost. Uh, some, I'll consider some quantum field theory or some field theory and uh, integrate out the degree. Okay, so this uh, notion of horizon thermality is a very central question in quantum gravity. This is something which has led to black hole thermodynamics, information paradox, and so on. But crucially, it's a relation between quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, and space-time geometry. So uh, this has led to a lot of research today, and eventually led to ADS safety, uh, string theory, and so on. Okay, so to just boil it down to the crux, uh, there is this Rindler wedge, which is a causal, which, there are two causally disconnected regions, which is a partition of the half space. Then we ask the question about the Rindler evolution and find that boost is the Rindler Hamiltonian. And you can naively think of this boost being a complex rotation. And usually when you think about thermality, you go to Euclidean time and it's a rotation in this uh, imaginary time. And that is the thing which leads to this thermality. So certain uh, essential features of this, if you ask what are the bare minimum ingredients, you can see that there is this symmetry structure, which is the Lorentz boost, which preserves the space-time structure. That is going into it. And there is this partition, and you are putting in quantum states. Just with these things, you are ending up with something, of, something related to thermality. And in fact, this is the uh, simplest way to put some uh, fundamental theorem called bisognano wickman theorem, uh, which is uh, Taking, uh, attracting a lot of attention these days, which basically is a theorem which proves this hawking Andrew uh, effect uh, in a much general setting. In fact, if you start with some quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, there is a way to relate these operators here over to the operators on that side. And it happens that that ends up in mixing the particle hole degrees of freedom. 
And whenever you have this particle hole mixing, you end up with Bogliobau transformation, which is probably a much more familiar way of looking at this uh, Hawking and Rowe effect. Okay. Okay, so I was told in one of, my, one of the summer schools I attended that if I show too many equations or too many difficult concepts, you should show a nice picture. That is one reason I put this uh, soothing picture. But the other reason is that what I've shown you is just the tip of the iceberg. Are surrounding this concept are so many different aspects and different approaches. Uh, for example, so the standard derivation of this black hole horizon thermality was uh, due to Hawking and Unruh, which involved taking a wave equation and quantizing the modes of the wave equation. The other approach, which in fact was motivated by quantum Hall effect, was due to Wilczek and Robinson, which involved something related to gravitational anomalies. And some more uh, nice work was done by R. Banerjee at uh, Saha Institute. And uh, the other picture is uh, about quantum tunneling, thinking of this Hawking radiation as a tunneling of quantum particles near the horizon. And some initial works were done by T. Padmanabhan at Ayuka Pune, and uh, furthermore works by, done by uh, Frank Wilczek. And something which I describe now is something called a modular evolution. Underlying that is this fundamental theorem. And there's another path integral approach which is also being used a lot these days. Uh, I'm just going to mention these because it, the, I certainly cannot do justice to describing any of this. But if you want, you can read uh, Witten's recent lecture notes to look at uh, what's happening here. There are many more uh, interesting aspects to this. But at the heart of all this is entanglement. So it's, there's still a lot of work to be done to understand these various different aspects and how does it all relate to this. Okay, so why, why, why as a condensed matter physicist, as I've been asked, why should I care about this exotic space-time structure? So let me just try to give a motivating or a broader context of how this Rindler Hamiltonian is appearing even in the condensed matter settings. So one particular uh, setting I can show you is uh, uh, starting with the works of Lee and Haldane and Kitaim and Preskills. Uh, Preskill, there were, uh, they showed that there is this bulk entanglement spectrum and edge physics correspondence. And that led to a lot of further works. One of the proofs, uh, geometrical proofs of this uh, particular aspect of quantum Hall physics involved trying to set up this Rindler uh, Dirac equation in the Rindler wedge and trying to <coughs> calculate the solutions of Rindler Hamiltonian. So the entanglement spectrum uh, comes out of this Rindler Hamiltonian. And there were other works which uh, were quite interesting. Uh, so that's one aspect where the Rindler Hamiltonian essentially appears in proving a fundamental aspect of uh, quantum Hall physics. And recently, there have been other various attempts to write down entanglement Hamiltonians for lattice models, for example, Easing model or Potts model. And this was done by Guidici and uh, Dalmonte and group at ICTP. And uh, so the essential thing which happens here is that the entanglement Hamiltonian which they can write down happens to be a Rindler Hamiltonian. So that's one of the cases where it can be done. And the, there are other works where uh, people have proposed realizations in cold atoms of this uh, Rindler Hamiltonian and uh, simulation and entanglement spectroscopy uh, in cold atoms again. And uh, there was an actual experiment which showed the Rindler evolution of a BEC in the lab at Chenjin Labs uh, in U Chicago. So what we will be trying to look at, look at is the entanglement of Hamiltonian through local physical Hamiltonian and try to realize that with applied potentials in quantum Hall systems. Okay. So it started with uh, Mike Stone, who I call the Vice Sage of Chambana. Chambana stands for Champaign-Urbana. So he showed in uh, uh, 2012, when I had just started grad school, that if you consider a quantum Hall system and you applied uh, this hyperbolic kind of potential, and uh, the single particle states will follow these uh, semi-classical trajectories. And you ask, classically, transition between these trajectories is forbidden. But quantum mechanically, there is a finite tunneling uh, probability. So that probability has this thermal form. And he, and he interpreted this as Hawking radiation. So he interpreted this point as the event horizon. And this has the interior of the black hole and the exterior of the black hole. So, uh, okay, so after many years, we started looking into this problem again and basically asked the question, okay, it looks like a duck, but is it swim and quack like a duck? So what it means is that it looks like a thermal form, but is it surely a coincidence or is there a fundamental or deeper reason uh, for this to be happening? So how many aspects of Hawking and Rowe effect, uh, like the aspects I showed you before, are captured in this setting? 
So let's try to, uh, so this is what we try to do and I'll try to explain now. So let's get back to quantum hall system and as you might have uh, studied that if once, once you project to the lowest Landau level, the degrees of freedom relevant for description there are these guiding center coordinates and these guiding center coordinates form a non-commutative plane and uh, you can also think of it as a phase space and uh, when you apply a potential to the full quantum hall system and when you project it down to the lowest Landau level, the description is purely in terms of these coordinates and there it happens that this boils down to an inverted harmonic oscillator. So when you apply this hyperbolic kind of uh, potential, uh, the relevant description is captured by this uh, inverted harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. Okay, so now let's try to see uh, some of the parallel structures uh, between the space-time platform and uh, the lowest Landau levels. Okay, so the platform there is the Minkowski space-time. Here it's a non-commutative plane. The invariant structure there is the space-time metric, which is given by this. Whereas here, uh, we'll consider the, this particular commutation relation. Now, the transformations which preserve this particular structure are the boosts and rotations in the Minkowski space-time. So whenever you perform a boost or a rotation, the space-time structure, the light cone, is preserved. It is not changing. And the secondary results of that are space, uh, length contraction and time dilation and so on. Uh, here, we look at area preserving potentials or flux preserving potentials. So basically, we are looking at potentials which uh, won't take you away from the lowest Landau level. And uh, if you ask what are those, so basically we want to take something and shear it. So, or if you rotate it, the area is still preserved. And uh, those form the specific, uh, the algebra of those transformations form an algebra called SL2R. And it happens that there is an isomorphism between the Lorentz group and this SL2R group. So the boost or the Rindler Hamiltonian which you would consider here is actually isomorphic to this hyperbolic potential which you apply in the quantum hall system. So this boost or the Rindler Hamiltonian which we saw to, is to be the central object in the hawking unruh thermality uh, will turn out to be this inverted harmonic oscillator here. And in fact, these were uh, motivated by some very old ideas by Dirac and Wigner who try to basically try, uh, try to uh, ask the question, how do I uh, formulate uh, relativistic Hamiltonian dynamics in phase space? And Wigner had some ideas about how to do this in quantum optics uh, also. Okay, so now this inverted har harmonic oscillator which we obtain in the lowest Landau level is a very fundamental uh, scattering model. It has been studied in, for cosmological infl uh, inflation by Alan Guth in string theory, uh, metastability in chaos in the name of Berry Keating Hamiltonian and the list goes on. So the scattering matrix, so as you can see here it's a scattering problem and you can exactly calculate the scattering matrix of this and when if you ask what is the tunneling probability that can be uh, extracted from this and that takes this form. And in fact this particular scattering matrix was already derived in Landau Lifshitz uh, quantum mechanics textbook. Okay, so now let's try to uh, Okay, so we saw that the boost is captured by this inverted harmonic oscillator and we also saw that there is this notion of half space and uh, all that in the context of uh, Rindler wedge. So let's see if that can be captured here. So let's ask what does it mean to do quantum mechanics on a half space? So usually we do quantum mechanics on a full space and we ask for Hilbert space wave functions which uh, you integrate over from minus infinity to plus infinity but now if I restrict to a half line I have these uh, uh, Yes, so I have, sorry, I've uh, skipped the units and all that. Yes. Uh, okay, so now I ask what are the self-adjoint operators I can define on this Hilbert space of wave functions. Now, if you remember uh, your basic quantum mechanics, you already saw that defining momentum was not that easy, even on the full line. So even here, for defining a momentum operator in the half space uh, Hilbert, uh, Hilbert space wave functions uh, takes a completely different form. It looks like a dilatation operator and the position operator also looks like this. And these form this canonically conjugate uh, observables. So it happens that these momentum eigenstates are basically the Rindler modes, the eigenstates of the Rindler Hamiltonian which you get in the relativistic context. Now you ask the question, what is the transition amplitude if I start from half space in, uh, to, go, to, trans, uh, to make a transition to the full space? 
and that happens to give you the scattering matrix of the inverted harmonic oscillator. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, quite a few ni niceties which come in calculating these things, something called a Mellin transform, which is a half space Fourier transform. So let me not uh, try to go into all that. So now you can ask the question, let's try to move away from space time completely. Can I come up with a notion of uh, phase space horizons? Is there a notion of phase space entanglement cut, which you, which, where, where you can partition the phase space and then ask if I look at the dynamics only within a particular region, I can get something like Hawking and thermality. And uh, there have been some initial works on phase space, uh, phase space entanglement cuts, but I am currently looking into uh, studying those things with Wigner functions. And uh, there are some very interesting ideas which Michael Berry developed uh, long ago. And it happens that those are related to this Hawking radiation. Okay, so there are many more interesting features of this inverted harmonic oscillator. One is something uh, called the quasi-normal decay or quasi-normal modes. So if you look at the scattering matrix of this inverted harmonic oscillator, there is this gamma function sitting there. So when you have a scattering matrix, you ask, uh, you try to look at the various features of that. And one of the features is the, are the poles of the scattering matrix. It happens that there are infinite number of these poles. And if you look at this, it pretty much looks like the spectrum of the inverted harmonic oscillator, except that there, are, there is this I sitting there. And you, there, there is an infinite number of poles in the lower half plane of the energy. Uh, these imaginary energy value, uh, uh, imaginary value eigenstates can be interpreted as, uh, as, as eigenstates which are purely outgoing. Uh, there is one formulation in that way. But what we'll be looking at is rather trying to tap these things through wave packet scattering. So when you send a wave packet, a Gaussian wave packet, and uh, scatter it against this particular potential, and you look at the reflected uh, amplitude, uh, if you see that as a position of space, what you see is that uh, it's trying to escape. It has a finite amplitude at large distances. And if you look at it with respect to time, it's decaying. So this is the nature of these uh, poles which are sitting in here. And you can see that the decay rates are uh, quantized. And so I have left out the coefficient here, but the decay rate basically comes and sits there. And uh, basically you get time decaying states in quantum mechanics. Usually it's not straightforward to get time decaying states with usual bound state quantum mechanics if you have e power i e t kind of factors. But through this, you can get these uh, decaying states. And uh, these poles are actually something which is uh, studied in the context of quantum chaos in the name of Berry Keating Hamiltonian and it's related to uh, some exotic features of Riemann zeta function and so on. Okay, now this is also kind of closely related to uh, quasi-normal modes which are studied in the context of black holes. And in fact, uh, it was C. V. Vishweshwara who actually discovered these by trying to study the perturbations of a black hole. So if you consider some uh, degree of freedom around the black hole, and you can write down a wave equation in a curved space time, when you do a lot of uh, algebra and uh, reduce it down by making some assumptions, it happens that this just reduces down to a Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation has an effective potential. So this turns out to be a, just a scattering problem. And uh, when he tried to do this perturbation calculation, he found that there are these, there are these quasi normal modes. But the crucial thing is that uh, usually it's very difficult to extract information from black hole. But these quasi normal modes carry the essential features of black hole, which are mass, angular momentum, and the charge. And in fact, these were the things which were uh, kind of uh, seen in the recent LIGO measurements, uh, which were done quite recently. And many people in this uh, institute are associated with. OK, so now uh, can we try to access these uh, uh, quasi normal mode uh, structure in quantum Hall systems? And so we are trying, we are, what we are trying to propose is that uh, these can be done using some time resolved measurements uh, where you have these quantum point contacts and you try to create wave packets by creating a barrier and sending in through, uh, uh, try, trying to create wave packets through. Uh, tunneling and uh, very low, low density uh, currents passing through a barrier and that should create some wave packets. And uh, after you do that, what uh, usually if you try to calculate the conductance, 
the, if you have some, these kind of poles, it results in a Breit-Wigner uh, distribution uh, function. The other way to kind of access this is through wave packet scattering and you send a wave packet and ask what is the time it uh, spends on the top of the barrier. So this is called the survival probability and if you take the log of that, uh, you can see a contribution which is a mark of a decay in this uh, system. Okay, so we have seen that uh, we are starting from Rindler evolution and Hawking Unruh, we see that you get some interesting dynamics in quantum Hall system. And there are, there are other free baggage uh, which comes with uh, this kind of analysis. So I showed you this isomorphism structure. If you don't understand, don't worry about this. What uh, I want to uh, say here is that each of these uh, algebra, Lie algebra structures in this chain of isomorphism correspond to completely different uh, physical situations, but there is a relation between each of these. So SO2,1 corresponds to uh, Lorentz kinematics, SL2R corresponds to area preserving transformations, SP2R is canonical transformations in the phase space, and SU1,1 is the generalized coherent, coherent states used in quantum optics. So an immediate uh, result of this is that if you, uh, uh, if you look at uh, two boosts, if there are two Lorentz uh, transformations done in different directions, that results in a rotation, and that's, called, that's the heart of Wigner rotation or Thomas precision, which was, uh, which accounted for a factor of two in uh, calculating the spectra of atoms. But now in the context of quantum hall, if you apply two shears in a different direction, that should result in a rotation. And that is kind of closely associated with hall viscosity. And it should be possible to uh, access these through applied potentials on the quantum hall system. And lastly, uh, Haldane has been uh, talking about quantum hall geometry where you apply uh, these SL2R transformations are very crucial uh, as they act on these correlation holes in the quantum Hall effect. So, so all I talked about was uh, about non-interacting systems, but in fractional quantum Hall systems, these uh, transformations will also be important. Okay, finally, let me summarize by saying that uh, we try to understand this thermal nature of space-time horizons and trying to distill these structures and see if they are accessible in quantum Hall systems. And we have all these uh, interesting phenomena. Uh, further work, uh, as I said, uh, we can try to study uh, how these applied potentials can be used to access some of these aspects like Hall viscosity or entanglement spectrum. And uh, currently, I'm trying to study Rindler Hamiltonian and lattices and trying to calculate this quantity called relative entropy and how it's related to something called Bekenstein bound. And lastly, this SL2R also appears in recent work of Ashwin Vishwanath and others uh, regarding Floquet CFT and uh, sine squared deformations and so on. Uh, finally, I would like to say that you can put quantum Hall effect in the center of this uh, and there are a lot of interesting things to study in that context. Specifically, this gravitational anomaly picture was inspired by quantum Hall when Wilczek proposed that. Uh, proposed that. And uh, I would like to share my excitement about this particular very simple model of inverted harmonic oscillator. So if you go back to Ramurthy Shankar chapter 4, the, he gives you a table comparing classical mechanics and quantum mechanics stating these different uh, aspects of quantum mechanics. But if you look at inverted oscillator, at each of these aspects, it gives you a something, a kind of very striking, uh, strikingly different feature. For example, it requires uh, extended Hilbert space, and wave functions can have finite probability current at infinity, whereas usually you want, to, uh, want them to vanish in bound state systems, and you can have decaying states, and you can have continuous and uh, imaginary eigenvalues uh, spectrum, and usually when you can this factor of half h cross omega, uh, h cross uh, omega by two comes from this non-commutativity of uh, x and p. Here it gives you a bound on the decay rate, which is also related to Lyapunov bound, uh, which recent works uh, have shown. Okay, thank you. Ah, okay, so, ah, so Mike Stone uh, showed that it can be up to millikelvin in the quantum Hall system. Second short question is, is inverted uh, oscillator potential has no bound. Yes. Is that the black hole type of thing hiding below? Uh, yes, but it's, if, if uh, you can also try to realize the same physics using a partial Teller potential, which has, which flattens out at large distances. But it has the same algebra structure, so one could try to access the same physics even in a bounded potential. 
So uh, maybe you told, uh, but uh, so what guarantees that there is no growing solution in this problem? Because you show just decaying solution, right? Yes. So what guarantees that there is no growing solution? Uh, how you prepare the system at the initial, okay. the initial uh, state preparation? Yes. So, as you're saying that uh, this uh, thermal things, that this uh, temperature thing that is coming in the uh, um, around the black hole horizon, has something to do with this uh, inverted harmonic oscillator potential, right? So, I, just one question is that uh, if there is such a potential, let's say, you know, which is uh, leading to such kind of phenomena, what could be the uh, source of such a potential in the space time? Uh, so the so it it's kind of difficult to see how it directly comes about. Uh, okay, so one simple the simplest way I can talk about it is you can think of it as a gravitational potential. So Newton the Newtonian way of thinking about it is gravity has this potential and you can think of it as a potential well. But Einstein's relativity has much more in complex uh, structure underlying it. As a result, if you look at the effective potential around a black hole. Apart from just having a well, it has this scattering barrier as well. And the, uh, if, you, if you wish, the WKB description of this potential barrier is given by this inverted harmonic oscillator. But uh, th there are few, so the barrier I described is kind of outside the black hole. The inverted oscillator I'm talking about is kind of a different thing. It's talking about the time evolution near the horizon. So it's talking about the uh, time, uh, something which is, uh, kind of intricately related to the horizon itself, rather than what's happening outside the horizon. So, uh, here in the quantum Hall case, when you have described the system, you have mostly talked about the some integer quantum Hall state like. So if you, and if you saw, in the one picture you have shown the hyperbolic potential model by the QPC, if you make the QPC in the quantum Hall system. I'm talking about, suppose you consider a fractional quantum Hall state, whole like fractional quantum Hall state. So will this uh, QPC model or yeah, this potential will exactly describe the, how the partition will happen near the QPC? So quantum Hall is kind of slightly different. Usually uh, for QPCs, you can you start doing Lutinger liquid physics for coupling these edges and so on. Okay. But uh, if you want to know if this kind of a potential which belongs to this SL2R, can it be used in a fractional quantum hall system? Then these recent ideas by Haldane, where uh, when you apply a potential and you reduce it down to lowest Landau level, they act on some of these correlation hole uh, geometries. So you have this guiding center. You, the semi-classical picture of that is these. There are these circular orbits, and there are, you can there are two degrees of freedom which decouple, and the things which couple to these guiding center coordinates can be could be possibly realized through this. Uh, applied potentials. 